Welcome to another episode of Comedy Wham Presents with me, your host, Valerie, and sometime co-host, Miss Purrington or Mookie. ComedyWham.com is your place to go for features about all Austin comedy. You can keep up with us on Twitter and Instagram at Comedy Wham or on our Comedy Wham Facebook page. In addition to podcasts, Comedy Wham brings you articles, album reviews, our advice column, Rochelle Takes on Comedy, and we've also got a festivals page and our FPIA 2022 page where you can keep up... <laughs> where our, uh, Mookie, our co-host, is about to make his introduction. Our FPIA 2022 page where you can keep up with all of the contest results. And of course, we're best known for our events page for live shows in Austin, Houston, and DFW. If you're a comic in those cities and want your show featured on the calendar, go to the events page and click submit a show to complete the short survey. Tag us on your Instagram stories and we'll share your show promo. Looking for ways to support all these resources we provide? You can donate to Comedy Wham on PayPal, Venmo, or even Patreon. Search for Comedy Wham on Patreon and check out our subscriber perks. Now let's get back to our podcast. Launched in 2016, the podcast project brings you funny people and their stories. As a fan, I like to delve into a comic's background and motivations, and will usually take a detour along the way. Consider the interview a way for you to get to know the folks that make the Austin comedy scene one of the best in the country. If you like this podcast, please rate and review us. Today, we have somebody who comes to us from the comedy mecca that is Boise, Idaho. He's been described on Reddit as Theo Vaughn with schizophrenia. He's been a podcast guest on The William Montgomery Show and Jason Rouse's Safe Word. I'm, I know I'm going to get this wrong. It's such a mouthful. He's the co-host of The Grimbly, but it used to be Grimace Half Hour Power Hour. And um, I have a Transformers addict son, so I, I did want to call out that on episode one, you can uh, hear him and his co-host talk about Transformers throwing up. Uh, he is a feature writer for Big Laugh Comedy, and I will be asking him hard-hitting questions like, what is your obsession with Grimace? And now Comedy Wham presents our guest, Casey Rocket. Hello. Hi. <laughs> Welcome. <laughs> yes. Was that mostly accurate? Uh-huh. Yeah, yeah. I'm from Atlanta, so but I spent a couple years in Boise before I came out. Ah, here, yeah. okay. Uh-huh. All right, that was... There's only so far I can scroll oh, back t- on, on yeah. Instagram to see <laughs> where was he last doing shows. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, I was out in Boise for like three years out there in uh, Idaho. Yeah. But yeah, I spent my whole life in Georgia. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. So now I can, now I can hear the, the Georgian twang. Uh-huh. <laughs> so you... you uh, well, we might ask about how you ended up in, in Boise, but... Um, I'm excited to have you. I'm I'm bummed. I've actually never gotten to see you live. I I was so close uh-huh. when I had you booked for the Comedy Wham showcase out here, and oh, then yeah. the venue just decided to quit all of their programming on <laughs> Tuesday nights, which was my show night. And then I've just uh, I have an impossible schedule. It's hard for me to get out with especially with my my son and his crazy thing so i've never seen you live but i've you know listened to the podcast and i've uh Mm. certainly seen your clips and uh uh, one interesting observation i'll I'll wait to it because i i'll I'll wait to get to it but i do have an icebreaker question okay that is one word to describe your past oh um (laughs) My past, uh, outrageous, probably. Yeah. Oh, I don't know. That seems <laughs> lame. <laughs> uh, troubled. <laughs> so, well, that's so, that's the comic's life, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> probably not outrageous. It's so weird to describe. Yeah. <laughs> You yeah. uh, you don't seem to be very comfortable with this interview process. <laughs> yeah, you know I don't. Uh, I spend ninety nine percent of my life uh, satirically, not mm-hmm. talking about anything. Yeah. Of meaning, so and I think I've built it that way. I think it makes me more comfortable. So yeah, when it comes to like talking about regular things, I'm not. I think I'm just out of practice. Mm. I'm not used to it. Yeah, yeah, I don't really talk to people about anything of merit yeah. or anything that has like any <laughs> any like real effects. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, I think that goes into my act too. I just don't. I don't know. I don't know anything about politics. I don't know anything. 
about like health or fitness or anything. <laughs> so I think I just like like nonsense. Nonsense yeah. makes me comfortable because then I can uh, ignore the realities yeah. of the world. I guess. Yeah. Well, since you're you're talking about what you're you're like on a stage and maybe even off stage the majority of the time. Uh huh. Uh, that is one. That is the thing that I wanted to ask you about because I saw a, f- a clip on your YouTube page that was three years ago, uh-huh. and I think three years ago you were you were in Boise. Yeah, and I watched it because I've watched a lot of your recent clips, and I'm uh-huh. like, oh, I see, I see you obviously, and I see like the germ of what we we see today on yeah. a stage, but it's like, it's pretty like contained Uh in comparison yeah so i want to know well you know we're going to kind of start with what your first time on a stage was but i am interested uh specifically in like in that three years of time Mm -hmm. what made you like really dig into the persona that you have today on a stage um yeah, I mean, I guess I've been just trying to figure out a way to take what I think is funny and then figure out a way to make that work on stage. So I used to do a lot of stories. Hmm. Um, like if I'm headlining something, I'll do a lot of stories. Still, like I'll do normally like 15 minutes of uh, whatever, normal Casey Rocket run around, one-liner type stuff, yeah. anti- shenanigans. But then I'll do stories, mostly like drug stories and things like that. Um, but yeah, it just changed over time. Like I can remember when I was in Atlanta, yeah, it was still kind of like crazy stuff, but I just couldn't really figure out a cohesive way of representing it, mm-hmm. like putting all the different parts together. So, you know, comedy, take like your 10 minutes or whatever. It just comes piece by piece by piece. So like I would, I improvise a lot. So maybe I'd be telling a story in Boise, and I make a certain noise, like, wah, or so, out of uh-huh. something, and then I'm like, oh, like, that felt good. You know, like, something that, like, clicks, I'm like, okay, that's a part of my act now. So it's just little mm-hmm. by little, I found a way to kind of freak people out in a way that works, Yeah, I guess. Um, so, yeah, it was just a slow progression, because I've always liked that, you know, I think I identify most with kind of... Um, absurdist type of comedy tim and eric type stuff yeah uh, adult swim type things so figuring out a way to do that on stage just took time i think when you first start i wasn't when i first i've been doing it for seven years when i first started i was 20 and i think you were gonna ask about that the yeah. first time i got on stage i i just sung a song <laughs> Kind of like a Jim Carrey type thing. Like I sung a song, and I, I sung Chandelier by Sia. Oh, my God. And uh, <laughs> it was at the school talent show when I was in college. And there's like 100 people there. I was the only person doing comedy. Although you wouldn't even know I was doing comedy because it wasn't even like... They would just say your name, you know. So, please welcome Casey Rocket. And I went up there and sung Chandelier and ran all around. And <laughs> dead silence, of course. <laughs> And uh, I, I think about this almost every day. There was a girl. There's like 100 people, so there's a lot of people crammed into this little auditorium. And I could still hear a girl in the way back of the room. It was that silent. And she went, what does he think he's doing? <laughs> and uh, I think about that all the time. Yeah. I think about it almost every day. Yeah. <laughs> that was like seven oh, years ago. Oh, man. <laughs> That's a memory to last for ages. <laughs> Holy crap. Yeah. <laughs> But I remember I, I liked that feeling of, and like, you know, I mean, maybe like a couple people laughed. I think I, at one point I, I had to say I was doing comedy, like, <laughs> this is comedy. Like, you know your act's good when you have uh-huh. to explain that you're, yeah, <laughs> I'm being funny. That's, that's, like, yeah, right. oh man, it's so embarrassing. <laughs> but oh, you have to spell it out for people. I'm being crazy right now. I'm being so silly. You wouldn't even believe it. Um, ugh. It's so embarrassing. So but, before that that uh, talent show where mm-hmm. you, in your mind, you were doing comedy, had you hadn't done an open mic, you had probably just watched uh-huh. other people do comedy uh, in your life. Mm-hmm. So what happened after the talent show? Um, yeah, after that, I like taped it on my 
iPhone, and I was all excited, and I was showing everybody, and I just decided that that's what I wanted to do. I mean, I think all I ever really cared about growing up was making people laugh. It's all I ever oh, wow. cared about. Maybe as a defense mechanism to look mm. at it psychologically. But, yeah, it's all I ever wanted to do. Like, that's always how I was, like, at parties and stuff, just nonstop, you know. I'm sober, but when I drink, uh, it's like how I am on stage. So how I am on stage is kind of like a representation of how I am when I'm drinking. I can't turn it off. Mm -hmm. I have a constant need the spotlight, you know? Yeah. Need the affirmation, which I'm sure is really hard to be around. <laughs> and I've heard it is. Um, so, yeah, like nonstop, you know, running around, type of like Robin Williams type, that like can't, something about my personality yeah. when I'm on like drugs and alcohol, I just can't, can't turn it off. So, um yeah, after that, I just decided, yeah, like, this is, I found what I wanted to do. Um, so. but, but then you have to almost channel it into these proper formats uh -huh. of the, you know, the grueling open mics to build yeah. up to a showcase. I mean, with that, with that craving that you have, how do you, I mean, how do you contain yourself in these mm -hmm. formats? Yeah, yeah, it was... It was hard. Where I went to college was a really small, it's Georgia Southern, so it was a town of like 30,000 people, the, okay. all the college, but there was no stand-up, there's no comedy clubs in Statesboro, Georgia, so there was one club that did it, it was a, a pool hall in like <laughs> a bad part of town, Oh, fun! and on Wednesdays they <laughs> would have stand-up. And yeah, it was just a bunch of locals in this smoky back room, and everybody's playing pool. And uh, yeah, so yeah, I tried to. I started out with the that running around and singing, which is weird because I've kind of come full circle because I still kind of do that. But after that, I was like, you know, I got to get serious. And I think when people are starting comedy, they think there's a certain set of ways that you do mm -hmm. it. Right, and yeah. the longer you do it, you realize that those conventions aren't true. You can do basically anything, and and if you work at it, you can make it work as a stand-up yeah. act. But so, I would try to do like one-liners and stuff, kind of like Stephen Wright type of deal. Yeah, and I, but I was really bad at it. Um, so I was so bad. I always tell people like when I see new comics at open mics, I'm like, you're not nearly as bad as I was. I was so bad for. <laughs> A couple years, I just couldn't get it. I just, uh, yeah, I would try to do one-liners in the, it's mostly like puns, you know? Uh -huh. I think a lot of people start out like that. It's just horrible jokes. And then... Did, were people telling you you were bad, or is this just your brain telling you that you're bad? <laughs> um, yeah, like, there wasn't, it was me. It was, was there a girl in the back <laughs> saying, what is he doing? Yeah, she just following me around town. <laughs> Leave me alone, I try. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, well, like I would have, there was a guy, he was my mentor, his name was uh, Christopher, and he was a comedian there, it was just me and him, we would do it every Wednesday, we were the only comedians in town, so he would kind of tell me, you know, like, look at what you're doing wrong, like, things like that, mm. um, and I could see that it wasn't working, I was so nervous, I would like shake up there, I was just so scared, so it took a long time, so I did that for like, for like a year and a half or two years till I graduated, um, just that once a week. So I wasn't able to do open mics because there was nothing around there. Yeah. It was like in the middle of nowhere. Um, so but then but I, despite all that, for, for a year and a half, you still were committed to this. Uh-huh. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I felt like I didn't have a choice. Like it was, mm. once I did that first set, I was like, this is a... This it was like it. the only thing that made sense to me. I was like, yeah. this is what I want to do. Even though I was so bad at it. You have flashes of, you know, one joke hits, or you say something off the cuff, right? You improvise something, and you're like, oh, I can't do it. Like, you know, you have a flash, and then you bomb for a month straight, and then you have another good set, and you're like, okay, like, I can. So I could tell, like, if I just worked hard, like, I would be able to figure it out. Mm -hmm. I think it was mostly the nerves. I just couldn't, especially when I, so when I graduated, I moved to Atlanta, and Atlanta has a great scene. Yeah. And I was there for probably, like, eight months. But when I got there, I realized how much more work that I needed. Like, I wasn't, you know. I think when you first start, you measure how good you're getting in time. 
you're like, oh, I've been doing this for two years, you know, like I'm kind of getting it. You know, I've been doing this for two years. But it's not, it's about how hard you work. You know, you could be doing it for 10 years, but if you're only going up, you know, once a week, it doesn't yeah. really translate. But how often were you able to get go up in Atlanta? I mean, that is a huge scene. Yeah. Yeah, you could go up three or four times a night. Wow. Yeah, so then I, when I got there, I remember I was going up like once a night for like a week. And then I was like, I remember kind of like looking in the mirror, you know, like a serious kind of like movie, like life moment i was like you know if you're gonna do this you have to be serious about it you know yeah so then yeah you could go up you can go up a lot atlanta's got a great scene but uh you know a lot of open mics are the same everywhere so a lot of coffee shows and pizza shops and terrible bars and stuff uh but it makes you better so fast those first couple years of of kind of grinding like that i mean month by month you're getting better so uh exponentially faster um so by the but, end yeah. of that eight months, were you starting to feel like things were turning around for you and you could feel a little bit more confident about what you were doing? Uh-huh. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Not convincing at all. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, I would have... I think I only... When I first moved to Atlanta, like the second week, I, I did a set where I told a story and it and it crushed for like the six people at the open mic. Mm-hmm. And it was the first time I ever like actually did good. And I was like, oh my God, like... I've, this won't be long now. Like, I got it. This story, you know, I'll probably be on Conan or whatever telling the story about shitting my pants in high school or whatever stupid story it was that, like, I don't even tell anymore. But, uh, yeah, so you, I would get, like, inklings of it. And I used to wear a jean jacket when I was in Atlanta. I would wear, every time I performed, I would wear a jean jacket that was covered in buttons. And, uh... I've always been a bit of a character, and I would uh, wear jeans, and that was just my performance outfit, and yeah, a lot of grimace stuff, and I would work on the same set over and over and over again, I remember doing that, Um, and it's not too dissimilar from what I do today, so I think it was, after I moved to Atlanta, I started getting the inklings of kind of what I wanted to kind of start doing more. Um, but yeah, but by the time uh, I was about to leave to go to Idaho, yeah, I felt like I was seeing some some progress. Yeah, yeah. get finally getting a little better. Yeah. So then you go Atlanta to Boise. <laughs> I know nothing about an Idaho comedy scene, let uh-huh. alone a Boise comedy scene, and it it like kind of crushes my heart because you're in Atlanta where you like you know if you were there for five years oh, yeah. you would just be crushing, <laughs> uh, but you kind of went backwards. So. I know, I know, I know. Yeah, you know everything happens for a reason. Yeah. Uh, so my buddies, the people I was living with, were my friends from high school in Atlanta, and so they were going to move to Boise to like whatever we'd been in georgia our whole lives they wanted to do like outdoors like ride bikes or whatever and so i was like okay i'll go with you guys like i'm not really doing anything else i'll go visit for like two weeks and so we drove out there and i was sleeping on their couch and my whole adult life i've never really worked like i work but i work like menial you know like deliver pizzas or whatever so i don't have savings or anything so i go out there and then uh, they do have a club in Boise. They did. It was called Liquid Laughs. And I remember going there. And when I moved to Boise, there's probably 20 or 30 comedians there. Huh. They thought automatically I was really good because I was from Atlanta. Ah. So when you're from a small market, you're like, you know, this guy, this guy, he did a show in New York City. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like yeah, yeah. people, they yeah. think you're like... <laughs> <laughs> This guy saw Mark Norman on a, <laughs> on a showcase yeah. two weeks ago. Yeah, they just think you're like, yeah. whatever, super good, uh-huh. even though you're not. But, but yeah, so they start, I started like actually like getting like little like showcases and stuff. I'd like never done a book show until I went out there. So then I got better a lot faster. And then, so I started doing stuff at the club, like hosting weekends. And I was awful at it. Eventually, they told me I can't do it anymore. Oh, no! But, because <laughs> I was trying to do, even now, even now, and I've done a lot of stand-up. If I'm, 
I don't I don't hardly host stuff ever, but it's hard for me to translate to a cold audience kind of what I'm doing. Mm. Um, I kind of have to be a little warmed up because there's not a, like a lot of traditional setup punchline joke structure, so I think it confuses people. Yeah, which is kind of the point, but that's kind of also what makes it good. So when I would host and I hadn't really figured out kind of what I want to be doing, oh man, I would just eat it. I would just I was just bombing all the time. So I think I hosted like three weekends. And then by the third one, the manager was like, you know, we love you here, but I don't think you should, yeah, I don't think you can do this anymore. Like, you got to make some changes. Like, this is not working. Um, <laughs> but yeah, so I started doing stuff at the club. So I was like, okay, I'll stay here for the time being and just like see how this works out. Like, I'm getting club work. Like, I thought like yeah. that was like, whatever, I'm going to be like a star like soon. And, then I met a girl. So the, the main reason I was out there is I was dating a girl for like three years. Okay. So then I started dating her, and then we moved in together. And then so she didn't really want to leave Boise. So then, yeah, like that wasn't, you know, yeah. really an option. So, yeah, I was just out there doing shows and, you know, travel around a little bit, go to like Denver and stuff. Mm. But, so yeah. Re- recapping, you know, your your college environment, you're just, you're eating bags of dicks. Uh-huh. Atlanta, you're making some progress, but it's so short. And then Boise, you're like superstar from out of, you know, this big comedy uh-huh. scene. So you kind of were able to leverage that, that reputation. And are, are, are we able to say that you built confidence uh-huh. in, in that time with your, with your comedy? Oh, definitely. Yeah, I started, yeah, it was like, yeah, I would like walk down the street and people were like, oh, it's Casey Rocket. Like Boise's <laughs> like, awesome. a, yeah, it felt like, I felt like a, like a celebrity yeah. out there. It was so, it was so nice. And, you know, there's only 20 comics, so we became really close, close knit group of like friends and yeah. yeah, it was a lot of fun. I felt, yeah, I got a lot better really quickly because I think I was given the opportunity to do longer sets you know, 10 or 15 minutes or even like headline shows and stuff, like when I definitely wasn't ready to. Mm. But part of, I think the biggest thing about being a comedian is your confidence. Like if you're really confident um, and you have like natural charisma, your material doesn't matter as much. You can, you can be up there and you can do well because the audience inherently wants to trust you. Like they inherently look at you like this guy knows what he's doing. So if you're confident, you know, that makes all the difference. Yeah. So yeah, re- yeah, I was able to get like you know, pretty quickly. Uh, felt like I was doing better, and I would imp- I started improvising a lot when I moved there, like riffing and stuff. Like I kind of made that kind of my whole thing. So I would do a different set every night for like a couple years. I would wow. do. Yeah, I don't know what happened to that. I feel like I lost. I must have been in my creative peak. I can't. <laughs> I don't write like that anymore. But yeah. <laughs> It would go good too. I would do a different set every night. I remember it. Go- I remember it going good at least. Yeah. Maybe it wasn't, but <laughs> <laughs> it was delusional. But. Since you were there for several years, were you starting to think? And I don't know if you you said you're. You know, you don't know politics. You don't know uh-huh. news stuff. Were you paying attention to the world of comedy? You know, L.A., New York, Denver. If you you went to, you said you went to Denver. Were you paying mm-hmm. attention to what a comedy career? was for other people yeah i think it was you know boise was kind of in a bubble like it's out there i had never even i swear i'd never even like heard of idaho growing up in georgia <laughs> i don't remember anybody ever mentioning idaho when i was potatoes. a kid potatoes yeah Come potato on. everybody knows it's potatoes I, I couldn't tell you where it was on a map <laughs> It sounded like some weird, like, foreign, like, you're going to move to Boise? It's like, okay, man, whatever. I'll drive out there. I'm not doing anything. But, so, yeah, when you're out there, it's like, you're not close to anything. So, we wouldn't have a lot of comics, like, come through town. I didn't really think about that stuff too much, like, Mm. bigger scenes. I think I just focused uh, on just getting better, because I knew I was so far from success anyways. It wouldn't really matter if I was in a place to kind of get a bigger opportunity. I just, I Mm. think I knew that I wasn't ready. I knew that I was getting better, but, you know, based off, like, the stuff at the club, I was like, you know, I can't. You know, I don't have, like, a 20 minutes or something. So it's not like I can, like, go on the road. So I knew just to work really hard 
there and I didn't really think about the long mm-hmm. term like that. Yeah. Um, my last year or year and a half, I was applying to festivals and stuff. So yeah, I applied to a lot of festivals. I think I got in I got into a good bit, like six or seven or something. That's great. Yeah, like the Boston I did the Boston Comedy Festival on Zoom. Oh wow. Oh man. Wow. It was so <laughs> You're sh- oh, I know. how did that translate? With my act yeah. too, yeah. Oh, it was, it was a brutal. wide angle yeah. camera. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it was like my my laptop <laughs> camera, and I was so excited. <laughs> this is uh, it. Must have been like the November. Uh, so it was like November twenty twenty, I guess, like right after the pandemic. Mm. And I told my family to watch, <laughs> and so my family's all tuned in on their laptops, and it, we set up a bed sheet as a green screen uh, behind me. And then I borrowed a microphone from a buddy that's not plugged into anything. It's just for, you know, like, yeah. uh, whatever, the fixation of having it in your hand. And so, like, everybody is basically doing one-liners. Like, that translates relatively well to yeah. doing Zoom. Like, traditional setup jokes. But, yeah, I mean, I, oh, man, I was so embarrassed. Yeah, like, they say, <laughs> like, and you're next comedian, Casey Rocket, and... Uh, it cuts to me, and I, I have the microphone, no cord, <laughs> and I got my buddy, the former co-host of the Grimace Half Hour Power Hour, my longtime friend Pierce, to sit next to the computer uh-huh. off screen so I would, wouldn't feel as awkward. I could kind of look at him, uh-huh. and um, you can't hear a lot of laughs anyways on Zoom, yeah. but it was like, I think I had to do like eight minutes or something oh. like, of total silence, just me in my living room. Uh, and, and a lot of my act is momentum based. Like if my first joke hits, like I'm good. Like I'll be fine the whole set. You know, it's like adrenaline type mm-hmm. thing. But if it's silence, like the longer it builds, it's just getting more and more away from stand up. It's like performance art almost. Like, oh man, I was so embarrassed. And the green screen, so the bed sheet works as a green screen and they project the logo of the Boston Comedy Festival behind you. And it, for some reason, with my hair, it was blending into the green screen. So, so I was like running around, you know, like like being trying to be funny. Uh-huh. And my hair would keep disappearing from second to second. So one second I would have hair and I would move to the left and it would disappear and it would just be my face. So I like look like, like, like a, I don't know, like a Talking Heads music video or something. Just like my little embarrassed face to dead silence. And then sometimes my body would disappear too. And it wasn't like I was wearing green. It was like something with the technology. Yeah, I can't keep up with <laughs> yeah, you. Yeah, I know. I was just, uh, the technology wasn't there yet. And yeah, it's like running around and I keep disappearing. And my whole family's watching. Oh, I was so embarrassed. And I remember like, oh man. I think my sister texted me something like, you know, I think it might be better like if you try to do something a little more traditional or something. <laughs> I was like, I know it would be better. I know it would be better. That's not the point. <laughs> <laughs> She's the new reincarnation of yeah. what is he doing? I know, yeah. <laughs> oh my God. Hey, but at least you got that credit, right? <laughs> yeah, it's a good, it was worth it for that, yeah. And it's a story. I mean, what a hell of a story. <laughs> I know. Yeah, that will be something that future generations of comedians will never understand, yeah. having to do those yeah. Zoom. I think I only did two Zoom things, but that was, oh, yeah. yeah. I forgot about that. That's rough. It was brutal. That's rough. Yeah. <laughs> we did, uh, we, we, under the guise of wanting to help comics who lost all uh-huh. channels of income, uh, we put on online shows. And uh-huh. so it was. It was very interesting to watch as a uh, what do you call it, um, sociology or anthropology like uh-huh. perspective to think about. You know how some people it translates; they know how to do it, and others are like, yeah. "This is a nightmare." Yeah. <laughs> and then others are like, "Absolutely not! I'm not doing your show." <laughs> so yeah, that you're right. Generations of future comics will never understand. Yeah, uh, that. I think some, I think a lot of comics would do okay with it. But you think about like some, yeah, it's just not, you know, it's just not stand up. It's just different. Like picture like William Montgomery or something like doing something like that. It'd be like, yeah. you know, it just doesn't, yeah, you know. Yeah. 
Anyways. Um, okay, so at what point do you, do you uh, and I, you know, uh, I, I assume there's a story here that goes with why you had or why you left Boise and how you chose Austin. Um, yeah, so uh, before the pandemic happened, I was planning on moving to Denver. Hmm. I was going to move to Denver that summer, so 2020, and then the pandemic happened. And then uh, the girl I was dating at the time, she was a comedian too, mm. so uh, whatever. She was really hesitant. She was more wanting to plan things, and I've just never really been like that. Like, if I want something, I kind of just go yeah. do it, for better or worse. But So I think we were, like, ready to – I was, like, ready to go, and then it didn't happen – and then our relationship didn't work. So then I was like, okay, so since that is not going on, I have really no reason to be here anymore. So I was thinking about moving to Denver. And then a friend of mine uh, in Boise, who's a comedian, he started saying that he was going to move to Austin. Hmm. And I had never thought about it or anything. Um, but I think it was when Rogan moved to Austin. So yeah. he's like, you know, this is kind of where the new place to do comedy is going to be. Um, or whatever. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> FYI, um, it's been around for a long time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I had watched, there's a documentary about the funniest person in Austin. Yeah, funniest. Yeah. Yeah, it's a great documentary. On Amazon. Yep. Yeah. Yep. And I had watched that maybe six months prior to mm. him saying that. And I was like, oh, it seems like, like a really fun city. I'd never been to Texas. Um, huh. So then... Okay, so he starts talking about that, and then I got into the Tower City Comedy Festival in Paris. Oh, yeah. Um, so that was 20, whatever, last year, 2021, it's yeah. so like March or whatever when that happened. So I flew down here, and I didn't know. <laughs> I, I've traveled a lot, but I'm not really, like, worldly, uh -huh. like, kind of, like, ignorant in some ways. So I was like, oh, how big can Texas be? <laughs> um <laughs> You had no idea how yeah. far Paris was from any major airport? Yeah. I was like, I'll just go to Austin. <laughs> oh, shit. Yeah, Paris is by Dallas, yeah. right? And so I was like, I'll just go to Austin and hang out in Austin for a couple days. And then I can rent a car and drive to Paris and it'll be fine. And so I land in Austin and I'm like staying in some hotel, like a sleazy motel. And I'm looking up rental cars and there's no cars because y'all had that ice storm. Oh. Right? So there's no, oh, there's yeah. like no cars in the state of Texas. So I'm like, oh God, I'm like four hours away. I flew all the way across the country. I don't know anybody here. I don't know a single person. And so I had to take a Greyhound <laughs> at like six in the morning to Dallas. And then I rode with some guy to Paris. And then I did the festival. It was great. And then after that, <laughs> my flight was still out of Austin. So then I had to go back to Austin. So then I, he took me back to Dallas. I had to take another Greyhound back to Austin. Just a calamity of errors, yeah. but from being a uh, meeting all the like the nice Dallas comics who were there, and I, I don't know if I met anybody from Austin, but then seeing the city, I was like, okay, you know, like this seems like a pretty fun, like a big city, like a place to be, you know, like having lived in Atlanta, I was like ready to get back to that. I was like, yeah. this seems like a great opportunity. Um, so yes, yeah, so then I went back and whatever was in Boise for a couple months and then in July of last year we drove out here and we lived in our cars I lived in my car for like six months wow so yeah yeah so I just drove out here I didn't know anybody out here um <clears throat> but that's just kind of just how I operate I don't really yeah. I've had a difficult time in life Mo most of it self-imposed with like drug and alcohol abuse mm -hmm. so so typical things that people worry about as far as like security, financial security, place to sleep, things like that, don't really bother me as much because I know like as long as I'm sober, uh, nothing too bad can really go wrong, um, which is true in a cosmic sense. You know, yeah. as long as I have control of my faculties, like I'll be okay. Like I'll land on my feet. I can go down there and I can find a job. So yeah, we just drove out here and I, I lived in a Walmart parking lot for like six months. Wow. <laughs> and uh, yeah, just did a bunch of open mics. And, uh, yeah, as soon as I got here, yeah, I started doing a lot of shows and stuff. And, yeah. How, how did you feel you were received by, by the open mics that you did? And how did you even discover them? Because it's a big city. Yeah. 
And yeah. did it happen to be comedy wham? I'd like to just, you know, pat my own ego and know that oh, it could have came up on the radar somehow. It could have been. <laughs> it might have been. Yeah, I think Yeah, I think back then. Yeah. Yeah, it might have been. Yeah, I was like, y'all and then I think that's when uh Kate Lois started posting right. open mics. So I Yeah. Yeah, I looked them up and then I think the first one I did was like Oh, it was Blind Pig. So it was Mondays. There used to be one of Blind Pig, and now it's Shakespeare's. But yeah, so then doing that, and then I started doing stuff at the Creek. And yeah, they liked me a lot. Yeah. Everybody was really nice. I think, you know, kind of what I do is so different. I didn't really have an adjustment period when I moved here. Everybody was like immediately like pretty nice. Yeah. Um, yeah, I didn't really do the crab thing. Like sometimes I do the crab <laughs> or whatever, <laughs> which is... Uh, if y'all haven't seen me, like it's just exactly what it sounds like. It's like I act like a little bit of a baby crab. <laughs> Everybody laugh. We go home happy. Yeah. And um, <laughs> so I think I did that like one of my first open mics here for whatever reason, and then all the comics loved it. So I was like, okay, I'll just do that. So <laughs> yeah, there's been my act has even changed a lot the year since that I've been here. You know, now I do a lot of like pictures and stuff on stage. Mm-hmm. I'll normally do like some whatever. Uh, I'll do some jokes and pull out a picture and harmonica and uh, do a little bit of prop stuff. Like, I only started doing that when I moved here, so. Yeah. Um, and you've done Kill Tony uh-huh. a handful of times? Or? No, just once. Okay. Yeah. I, I, but you got in, in Red Band's Good Graces. You've been on uh-huh. the Death Squad show. Yeah. Yeah, I've done it a lot. Yeah, I did it on Thursday. Um, yeah, when I moved here, I've been here for like a month. And I did William Montgomery's show, The Big Red Machine at Vulcan, Mm -hmm. and did really good. Probably had the best set of my life. And then someone told Red Band about it. Red Band wasn't there. And I had a show right after that at Creek, so Red Band walked over and watched me at Creek Mm. and liked it a lot, and he was really nice. And then I think that kind of changed my life. He posted a picture of me on his Instagram. So then I got like 2,000 followers like overnight. So, yeah. So that, like, yeah, that, like, changed everything. So then I started doing the secret shows, like, most weeks. Um, yeah, and then I, I had never even done Kill Tony. So I didn't... Normally people do Kill Tony and then do the secret yeah. shows. Yeah, he actually flipped the script. Yeah, he just happened to see me. Yeah. Um, well, if you get a William Montgomery endorsement, that says a lot. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I love William. Yeah, I, I'm kind of, like... Uh, the co-host of his podcast now. Yeah, William's so great. So, yeah, I did kill Tony like two or three months ago, and it was fun. Yeah. Yeah, it was great. Yeah, so was are fun. you hearing that voice anymore? The one from the back of the room that says, <laughs> 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 what is he doing here? <laughs> Sometimes, yeah. And I, I think in my mind, I need to have that happen. I need to be doing different things that don't work. One, to feel alive, and two, to be able to push the act to what I want it to be as a cohesive, you know, a a, a larger thing that I've been working on. It's not just like chaos. Like, there's a lot of moving parts that I've worked on hundreds of times, you know, little things that ideally go go to get, like, there's jokes, like, uh, it's hard to explain. So a lot of it's like, (laughs) yes, some of it's improvised. But a lot of the little things I'm doing are are things that I've worked on like hundreds mm. of times. So it's remembering all those things and adding new things. Um, yeah, I mean, certainly as a, as an outsider observing, just watching the the clips that I've I've watched, I would never have imagined that you've said the same thing twice. Yeah, like you pull off that high energy, like absurdist style so well that it's like that's part of the excitement is uh-huh. is thinking if I'm going to go see Casey Rocket. One night, two nights, three nights in a row, I'm not going to get the same thing. Yeah. Yeah, and I, I think a lot of it, yeah, there is. Like, it, there's just a lot of moving parts. Again, yeah, I couldn't tell you on any given set how much would be improvised and how much wouldn't. Mm-hmm. But, you know, sometimes, like, the whole thing will just be, you know, off the cuff. But then other times, you know, whatever, little things that you work on. Yeah. <clears throat> but, yeah, I, I think I try to keep doing things that, I haven't seen before and figure out a way to make them work, you know, just absurdist things. So I, 
yeah, I don't I don't bomb too much, and not as much as I used to. But yeah, I eat shit. Yeah, I still do a lot of open mics. So yeah, <laughs> but that's part of the fun. I, I I think to really get good, you have to be you, like I always tell people. I tell people you have to learn to bomb before you can learn to crush. Like yeah, if you can be comfortable bombing and being like truly. Not like pretending like it doesn't bother you, but if it truly doesn't bother you when you're up there, I think you're like pretty close to, to getting where you need to be. Because that's yeah. a big part, you know, yeah. not being afraid of the silence. Since, since you're, you're part of the new guard of, of Austin comedy, I'm curious if you've hung out with some of the, the old guard comics enough to have heard the name Andrew Clarkston. Yeah, people have said that. <laughs> uh-huh. Someone told me that. Um the other day yeah i've heard it like three or four times yeah you're like the the new guard version of, of andrew clarkston uh-huh i've never seen just, him yeah i don't, I don't know. know if you can even find clips i couldn't of find him. any yeah. yeah i'd love to see him yeah it was yeah. always that kind of high energy but like even yours is like like he would still stay pretty stationary like i you must i don't know do you drink red bull you said you were sober but i don't <laughs> know how you can possibly maintain the energy on stage that you do <laughs> I think it's just an. I don't drink caffeine or anything. Oh gosh, yeah. it's all natural. <laughs> yeah, I just. I think I'm a little, like ADD or whatever. Mm. So I think it's just mostly adrenaline. Like, yeah. I'll normally pump myself up for like thirty or forty five minutes before I go on stage. Even for like an open mic, I'll, I'll pace around. Um, yeah, like uh, drop it low, you know, like stretch. Like I stretch. It's like I'm going to like whatever, do wind sprints or something. But I think it also gets me in the mindset of, like, what I'm doing on stage, like, it is me. Like, that is a part of me. And, and like I said, that's, that's how I act when I drink. So, like, that's me. I just have to work myself up to be able to get mm-hmm. ready to go, like, you know, kind of like tornado of, like, whatever. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, no, I'm all, I'm all natural. Yeah, I've been sober for a while, so, yeah. yeah. Um, since <clears throat> you've mentioned that, and if you're comfortable, like, um, how important, like, is there a message to other people? Because I know, you know, I'm an old lady, so I, that is, that kind of lifestyle is long, long uh-huh. behind me if, <laughs> if I ever uh, did anything. Uh, but, like, to me, being in your 20s and being a comic means you're doing drugs uh-huh. all the time. I just assume that that's happening. Yeah. Um, was it... Uh, what do I want to ask? I just, I guess I want to ask your perspective and maybe you're not, you're probably not the kind of advice uh, mm-hmm. giving personality anyway, but like, can you imagine your life performing comedy in this great setting where like you've really built up a reputation for yourself and like you're, you're getting the notice of big names <clears throat> if you had not given up drugs and alcohol? No, no. No, definitely not. So, yeah, I stopped drinking when I was 21. So I had a really bad drinking problem. Mm. Uh, I had to go to detox and stuff. Like, I would have the shakes and stuff. So it wasn't... I think I was drinking for, like, my first, like, year of doing comedy. And I think when you're drinking, I think... And particularly, most people who do comedy probably have addictive personalities anyways. When, when you're drinking, you're not retaining information as good. So mm. I think if you're doing open mics and you're doing shows and you're drinking, you still might be like crushing, but you're not learning from it. You're not, Mm. you're not growing. And I think also it's a, it's a false sense of, of bravado and a false sense of confidence that it's easier. You know, I know a lot of people drink like when they're first starting to kind of take away the nerves, but you will, if you want to be successful, you will have to get used to doing it sober. You just will. Like you, you won't be Stanhope. Like I know I've fallen into that. Like, I've had, like, plenty of, like, slip-ups and sobriety and things like that. And I'll kind of glorify kind of, like, the Stan Hopes or, like, the Mitch Hedbergs of the world. Um, like, the rock and roll comedians. But those comedians are, there's so few of those. Yeah. Like, there's only a couple who, like, drank throughout their, like, almost all the comedians you see are sober. Mm-hmm. Like, almost all successful comedians don't drink like that. Yeah. So... Yeah, I just don't think it's really, for most people, I don't think you can do both. It's just not something, like you can't be, for example, like going on tour and you're all hungover and then, yeah. you know, like cause the problem is, and the problem with me drinking is I'll be so hungover 
it's like I can't function unless mm. I drink again. So, oh, gosh. And especially yeah. with performance, too. Like, you can't be hungover, so then you're going to drink again. And then it's just such a vicious cycle, mm. you know? So I know for me personally, yeah, I could, definitely couldn't do both. I couldn't. Uh, yeah, I, I think, uh, you know, comedy is enough of a rush yeah. as it is. I, don't, I couldn't do it, yeah. You also have struck me as somebody that's very in the moment and not necessarily looking forward to, you know, what you do next, what you tackle next. Um, are, you, are you really happy being in Austin? Do you ever think that, you know, as you get more comfortable being a comic, a headliner comic, that you might <clears throat> want to move again to a, a big city like L.A. or New York? Um. I don't want to move to L.A. I don't think I would like to live in L.A. Hmm. I don't think I would like anything about it. I've heard it's difficult. Yeah. But I would love to go, you know, do the comedy store and stuff like that. Like, that's every comic's yeah. dream. I yeah. would love to do that. Um, but if I am going to move, I would want to move to probably New York. Yeah. I think maybe, like, three years or something. Hmm. Like, when I, when I know, like, I'm, like, a lot better, yeah. then I'll go out there. But I think Austin... <clears throat> It's at a place where, like, the vertical growth is, like, it's, comedy's getting so big here, I don't see any reason why you would want to go anywhere else. That's why everyone's yeah. moving here. Yeah. Like, I, w I love that. I think I came here at the perfect time, like, yeah. with a new wave of, of really great comedians and really great friends, and then also all these um, old scene comedians who have been really um, nice lately. The past couple months, I've been working a lot more with, like, Hunter Duncan mm -hmm. and and a lot of like really nice people there. So like the the talent here is just nuts. So I'd have no no reason to go anywhere else. Yeah. It's really it's really a great scene. Everybody's so nice too. I really like it. Here. Yeah. Yeah. So fun. It's probably somewhat familiar to the the nice southern mentality that you you have in Georgia. Uh-huh. And that's, you know, part of Austin yeah. and yeah. Yeah, I I love the south except the bad you know, whatever the bad <laughs> yeah, stuff that goes along with that. The bad stuff is not good. But yeah. the southern <laughs> hospitality is yeah. uh, is just great. I li I like the demeanor. Of yeah. It. Yeah. Well, let's talk about some of the other projects that you've got. You uh, you've gotten obviously a lot of attention from the folks at Big Laugh Comedy, and you've been writing for them, mm -hmm. and you're on your your <clears throat> grimace grimly whatever it is. <laughs> yeah. So <laughs> now part of their podcast. <laughs> I know there's a history, and then you had you've ch you had to change it probably for licensing. <laughs> yeah, I think it was a copyright <laughs> thing. So yeah, me and my my buddy did the Grimace Half Hour Power Hour for like three or four years, where we improvised stories about Grimace and <laughs> <laughs> and about him, like whatever, like being a war criminal. Like we make him out to be like a terrible person, uh -huh. right? But I think that in doing so, I think that falls under parody law. So yeah, I would think so. I would think so, but I'm, I would hate for them to, like, whatever. If for some reason it doesn't, then you have to take it all down. So, mm. um, so yeah, now it's the Grimby Half Hour Power Hour, and it's on YouTube. And it's me and Kat Swatner, um, great comedian here in Austin. And, uh, yeah, we started it up with them. I think we're four episodes in to the new run. Uh, yeah, it's all on YouTube. That's really fun. Yeah. Um, yeah, Big Laugh's been great. I, I write weekly comedy news articles for them, um, and then I do these little videos weekly um, about comedy news stuff. Yeah. So, yeah, that's been fun. Then I'm doing William's podcast, and that's great. And then I run a show with Michael Fractor from 20-somethings Austin, uh, the <laughs> Netflix Reality show. He's a great oh, comedian funny. here. Oh, yeah. Wow. <laughs> so we started running a show together two weeks ago. So that's uh, called yeah. the Fish Bowl. So yeah. yeah very cool. Yeah, well, you'll have stuff. to submit it to Comedy Wham. So it'll be on our events page. Oh yeah, yeah, for sure. Oh man, these people. <laughs> <laughs> so easy. We make it so easy. Um, is there anything we haven't talked about that you want people to know about you? Um, I'm just a, I'm just a really nice guy. Um. I, I I've actually heard that a lot. <laughs> that you're you're wild and crazy on stage, but like you're a really nice nice person. <laughs> Do you uh, think people don't think that? No, I don't know. I, don't know. <laughs> I just am who I am. Yeah, I don't know. We don't need to know about that. But 
Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, I mean, that's that's pretty much it. Yeah, I'm really excited about the Grimace uh, Half Hour Power Hour. Uh, that's really fun. We have some great comics coming yeah. up on that. Um, and, yeah, I don't know. All my shows are on my Instagram. And, yeah, I'm just happy to be here. I think this is a great, great scene. It's uh, Yeah, I can't think of anything else. Yeah, I have a pretty full schedule. You know, I love writing comedy and... Um, yeah, I have some fun satire articles if you Google, like, Casey Rocket, Points in Case. Um, hmm. There's some fun stuff. I used to try to write satire a lot um, uh, for various comedy magazines, things like that. Oh, cool. Um, so, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, just try to, I don't know. Comedy is basically my, my, like, full-time job, but I just don't. It doesn't, like, pay that well yet, but, yeah, so, <laughs> yeah, I just have, always have a lot of stuff going on. I think that yeah. uh, it's good to have a full a full life, and and particularly in relation to sobriety, I think if you, I mean, the key is to stay really busy, so it's nice to, you know, have your fingers in a lot of, like, pies or yeah. whatever. Do you so. feel like, like you're near that tipping point where you can say, I don't, I don't have to work anymore because what I'm doing with comedy, whether it's writing, performing podcasting is is paying enough of the bills i mean you've lived uh-huh. a miser's life <laughs> if you've lived six months in a car yeah yeah it's close yeah i'm really close yeah i think maybe in like three months yeah because i have my patreon oh that's another thing yeah ah. i have a lot of like exclusive uh, uh, whatever <laughs> i <laughs> wish this was recorded terrible. so you could have seen yeah. the face the face you made <laughs> whatever i have a lot of like sets on my patreon like a lot of the secret shows are on there um and fun stuff like unpublished writing and stuff so yeah so that pays a little bit and then uh me and michael's show i think once we get that going that's we sold out the last one so once we can get that rolling i I think i'm pretty close so that's really exciting and where are you having that show it's at native hostel okay Okay. um i I, I think the next one's gonna be on the 29th of september so we'll let y'all i don't know it's on my instagram but yeah. yeah yeah a lot of fun stuff going on very cool. Uh, I felt like there was one other question that I was going to ask you, and it escaped my brain. Um, oh, I, I was curious, because uh, there's an un- underlying thread of like being really philosophical about your life. Do you, do you study your, your tapes, your recordings? Uh, no, I used to uh, my first couple years, but I feel like I'm pretty good at retaining information. So I'll normally work like on a new set, like... Every week, I'll try to work on like three or five new minutes, and uh, I'll just repetition. So I don't really watch them mm. as much as I used to, but um, you know, kind of doing the the wacky kind of things that I do, it kind of gets burned in your brain, especially when something doesn't work. It's like really impactful, <laughs> like <laughs> whatever, like doing this crazy stuff. Like if you whatever spit out a gold chain and nobody laughs, you're like okay, that doesn't work, Hmm. you know? So the things that work and the things that don't, I'm pretty good at remembering. So I I don't, I don't watch it as much as I, as much as I used to, but, um, it's kind of embarrassing. Not really embarrassed. Like I'm proud of what I do. I do it for a reason, but I don't need to watch it. (laughs) The longer I do it, the less I want to watch it. Yeah. Yeah. So (laughs) because you figured out the formula in your own brain. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. I'm so glad I've gotten to know you. This is really cool. Now I just yeah. need to make that step of you know getting to your your live shows. Yeah, so I can see this in action <laughs> for myself. <laughs> and everybody oh, should definitely you. make make plans to to go see you. <laughs> it's it's an experience. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> yeah, try to make it something. Yeah, you never seen or whatever. Yeah, yeah, very cool. All right, uh, I have a closing question. Are you ready for it? Mm-hmm. <laughs> One word to describe your future. <laughs> um, friggin' outrageous. <laughs> oh, <laughs> nice callback. <laughs> callback. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, that is a wrap on Comedy Wham presents Casey Rocket. Uh, tell us those social medias and uh, recap again that that new show you've got coming up and all your oh your yeah podcasts. Um, yeah. So. I mainly just use Instagram. I'm Casey Rocket on Instagram. I'm Casey Rocket on TikTok. Um, I have a Patreon full of fun stuff. Uh, Patreon.com backslash Casey Rocket. Um, my YouTube, Casey Rocket. A lot of stuff on there. And then I run a new show with Michael Fractor. 
um, called the Fish Bowl. That's at Native Hostel once a month. That's on my Instagram. I also do the Grimace Half Hour Power Hour on YouTube, <laughs> and then the William Montgomery Show on YouTube as well. Very cool, busy, busy guy. All right. Well, we hope you've enjo- enjoyed learning about how Casey uh, got to be the comedic genius that you heard today, just as much as I have. This has been Comedy Wham presents Casey Rocket. I'm Valerie, and that's been funny. Thank you, Casey. <laughs> Thank you.